Hey all, it's your boy Ramoy George Philip the First, and on today's episode we cover a lot of heavy, complex ground. So in order to give us all the space to hear these ideas and then take the time to digest it all, we've split today's episode into two episodes. So we'll get part one of our interview with Dr. William Liu today, and part two will come to you in the near future. All right all, now it's time for the masculinity podcast enjoy hello my name is samantha Zessi. it's your boy Ramoy george philip the first and this is masculinity so a lot of really great things have happened since the last out, the time that we saw each other. What? I, I think a lot of things have happened since the last time we saw each other. Ha- Trump left our country. Yeah. And he got booed. He got like majorly protested in England. Did you see the tantrum? K? You see the tantrum Piers Morgan threw the other day? No. It's awful. YouTube I, that. Or okay. Google it. He threw a big tantrum at a brown girl. It was just unconscionable i don't even say that word i don't even know what that word means but i think it was that it sounds like something repulsive or something like how could you it possibly like do a this? tantrum i would usually throw but for him to be on national global tv to throw a tantrum at a young woman it was pretty repulsive so i Ugh. learned not to do that ever ever gross well i mean Piers morgan is also fuck shit like 95 percent of the time so unfortunately i'm not surprised but you know um that just makes me feel a lot less bad about the fact that England lost and will be battling in third for the third place, while my birthplace will be battling the final tomorrow. So, yay us. Can I say something? Please. I used to ride for the original Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. I loved it. Bravo. 2003. Just Queer Eye was my shit. Carson was hilarious. Jay was my, like, he was, like, racially ambiguous brown. Love Jay. And so when the new Queer Eye came back, or or there was the new Queer Eye, I was like, eh, I ride for the first one. And then I watched the first season in like a day. I was like, oh my God, the show's so good. And then this new season came out, and I was a little bit like, I was going to be like, I don't know if I can do it. And the other day, like it was on, and the first episode happened with Tammy. I was, I was. Did you cry? I I was fighting to hold back the tears. (laughs) You don't have to, you could cry. You and know? then the second episode, I don't remember the dude's name, but I was like, I got it. It just tears happened. And then I was like, man, why am I trying to hold back the tears? Exactly. Did you hear that you were like performing masculinity it in was. that moment? Yeah, there you go. I mean, I haven't watched it, but I heard that it was like incredible. So if I ever found out that first episode is like highly fabricated, a lot of the storylines, I'm going to be very upset, Who's even though betrayed? it probably <laughs> is. What are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah, so this season we've tackled a lot of complex ideas. We've broken down the effects of film on the way we learn and perform masculinity. We've unpacked black masculinity and living in the shadows of uh, white supremacy. Uh, We've also talked through intersectionality and how to live in a non-binary world. So today we're going to take a few of those ideas and go further into the conversation so we can get a better view of the mask. Mask with a K, that is masculinity. And those ideas we're going to cover today are white supremacy, hegemony, and intersectionality. Yeah, so that sounds pretty intense. <laughs> um, um, but don't worry, we're not going to do this by ourselves. Uh, we do Thank actually, God. yeah, right, I know. <laughs> um, we do actually have a professional with us today. Uh, we have Dr. William Ming Liu, who is a licensed psychologist and a professor who will be starting in August uh, a new faculty position, if we know correctly, uh, as a department chair at the University of Maryland. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, So Dr. Liu specializes in the study of men and masculinity and is the editor of the new scholarly journal called Psychology of Men and Masculinity. Dr. Liu, we're honored to have you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to this conversation. A very important conversation, timely as well. Thank yeah. you. I want to I want to quickly go off script. You are you you are or you are at the University of Iowa, correct? I'm currently at the university. Well, I, I'm in between jobs right now, so I've, uh, I just ended my position at the University of Iowa, and I'm starting in August at the University of Maryland at College okay, Park. Okay, yeah, I, w- I just want to ask, are all those fucking writers assholes? Like, is the writer's workshop, <laughs> are they just a bunch of jerks? 
because I just, I mean, I, w- I don't call myself a writer. I write things and I hang out with writers and they're just a bunch of jerks, I feel like. Uh, I don't you know, know what we're it, about, but okay. they, <laughs> uh, they are, they're an interesting bunch. They are, uh, you Feel know, free my, to be as uh, di- diplomatic as uh, possible. Well, I, I'll tell you what, my, uh, my spouse, my wife is a writer. She got her MFA from the program. Mm. And Never mind. She, I take back everything no, 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 I said. No, no, listen, listen, we've had these conversations a lot. So, uh, <laughs> and you know, as a psychologist, I'm entering into those communities. So I'm thinking, wow, this is a really eccentric bunch, but, <laughs> um, but that's what makes their writing so unique, you know, yeah. and so interesting. And some of, and, and it, it, you're right, though, some of them do play into I'm a writer. You know? <laughs> and, they, and they carry it, they play into it, they, that's what, do, see, they so, do that thing. Samantha right? always like says, Oh, you're a writer. And I'm like, I am not a writer because that's what I think of <laughs> oh, is the okay. Iowa Writers Workshop. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Anyways, yeah. I'll, others, I'll take that in mind. Are a little more kooky and a little, you know, more eccentric, and uh, and and they're just, you know, they're an interest. Some, most of them are an interesting bunch, but a few of them uh, can be, you know, I'm a writer. <laughs> They, it's they, funny how when you say that it's like there's a whole world yeah. where like oh i know exactly what you're talking about <laughs> yeah yeah right so yeah. yeah they carry it they wear it so it's important for them oh uh, that's good um all right so let's so let's get into it here so you're not only uh, a, a psychologist but you're also focusing your current research on white supremacy whiteness and masculinity so mm-hmm. you know i mean we're all folks of color here so i want to know like what like where did you get this motivation from yeah Thank you. Uh, well, so I've been working on this particular area of research, white supremacy, uh, because I was presented with a question around white privilege um, about six years ago. And for about six years, I've been working on what is white privilege as a singular question. And as I sort of went into that particular topic, I um, I started understanding uh, the importance of really talking about white privilege as a function of white supremacy and racism and gender and sexism, misogyny. So, um, and I, what I started to understand uh, more so is my dissatisfaction with the ways in which we understand privilege, that we've talked about privilege and it's become uh, essentially very colorblind and disempowered and it's become this cliche topic that people talk about in college, but really we've avoided the larger, more fundamental foundational issue of white supremacy. And if we focus it on white supremacy, it's much harder to move the conversation away from, uh, from uh, about power and racism and institutional um, Mm -hmm. biases and systemic problems and historical biases as well. Um, what I found is that when white people want to talk about white privilege, they want to talk about it as sort of this very individualized notion of things they get to do. Mm. And um, that is a very colorblind, power evasive, uh, color evasive approach to understanding what white privilege really was meant to be when Peggy McIntosh first introduced it in the um, late 80s. Um, and it was introduced as a way to critique power but it very quickly got co-opted hmm. appropriated by whiteness white supremacy and disempowered How and ironic so <laughs> it's completely ironic yeah. it is complete in the same way i know later on i I'm, I'm sorry i'm jumping ahead but in the same way that um we want to talk about intersectionality intersectionality was originally meant as a critique against white feminism Right. But now we talk about white. uh, Now we talk about intersectionality as a multiplicity of identities, which is not Mm. the same thing. Mm. Right. And and now we talk about intersectionality as just a platter of identities, of intermixing of different identities. And we've lost the importance, the fundamental uh, uh, importance of race and racism in how we understand identities and how we understand intersectionality, how we understand institutional biases and historical problems and systemic issues. It's it's a it's 
always going to be about race. No, I mean, the, giving us that context and what intersectional, intersectionality was, is, and how it's kind of been manipulated or molded into what it has currently become is great context for this conversation and all our future conversations. I'm wondering if you could also give us some definitions and some context to these two other huge words that sometimes get thrown around without really being grounded, and that's hegemony and white supremacy. Hegemony is often confused with this idea that it is strictly about oppression. In other words, it's strictly about uh, ruling society through uh, direct oppression. And that's that's not necessarily what a, a head, uh, hegemony, hegemony means. Uh, hegemony actually is not necessarily the rule of society through coercion. It's actually the rule of society through consent. And hegemony. And hegemony means hegemony it, it, because if if society were if society was built on this idea that there was a ruling class and an oppressed class, it wouldn't function very well because you would have these constant revolutions all the time because you could figure yeah. out the yeah. you could figure out the boundaries between the oppressed class and the and the um, oppressor class, right? The boundaries would be very clear. But hegemony is uh, much more complex because hegemony is really the rule of society, um, the oppression and racism of society that's naturalized, that becomes a natural part of society, that we consent to being ruled and we consent to racism in some ways right in many ways we consent to sexism we consent to classism we can we really in a sense consent to economic inequality let's say right and in order to do that you really have to create a middle class you really have to create a middle group that um owes its power and prestige and privileges and status to the upper class um, but is not quite the oppressed class Right. And so they're this middle class. Yeah. So if you have a large middle class, you have the middle group of folks that um, that believe that they earned what they have, that they believe in meritocracy, mm -hmm. that they believe in working hard and that society is fair. Then what they start to tell people in the lower classes look you could be middle class if you do what we're doing if you right they kind of almost funnel the dogma and funnel the ideologies they, they from do right? between classes right they funnel the ideology between classes and so and they so, maintain that like they actively benefit from this in the system being maintained the way that it is at the detriment of the people who are oppressed exactly yeah. so anybody okay. who anybody who fully believes uh, in meritocracy, the research shows that they're also going to fundamentally believe in fairness and, and inequality. In other words, if you believe you work for what you got, you're also going to believe that there's, oh. there's legitimacy in inequality, mm -hmm. right? Because they're the group that they're the group that's going to say, well, clearly you didn't work hard enough or clearly you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing because if you did what you're supposed to be doing, you know, you'd be in the middle class with us, you know, you'd be successful and you could send your kids to college. And um, all of these pieces, this ideology makes the middle class believe that everything that they've done, they've worked for and that they've earned. Um, but the reality is, is the data shows that, um, Classes in our society are relatively, in the last uh, 30 years or so, relatively fairly stable, and the intergenerational, I mean, the movement between classes is not as porous as people want to believe. And so um, what that also says is that um, uh, not only the class is stable, but um, the, uh, an important piece of being in, a, in your social economic class is intergenerational wealth right yeah. so you're going to likely be somewhere in the same social class as your family of origin right there, there's some variability but for a large part um uh the transmission of social class is relatively pretty stable right that you're you're going to stay within your in your social class um that's that's fairly true for people who are white 
Um, it's much more difficult for people of color. Uh, the research shows as well, for instance, that um, in order for a person of color, especially an African-American family, to move between, let's say, a lower class and, and up to the middle class, they have to have almost 20 years of stable economic a stable economic situation. In, or, in other words, they can't experience any kind of economic trauma, job losses, health traumas. They need 20 years of stability in order to move into a different class, hmm. right? And so that's that's almost impossible. It's almost impossible because it it, it just is. Yeah. The, the data shows it, it yeah. just is what it is. Hmm. So, um, so that's hegemony in a nutshell so that's that's uh coercion right it, it's not it's not coercion it's consent people consent to it. well say, i think you know. yeah me and samantha always talk about consent and kind of culpability within masculinity mm-hmm. and complicity specifically yeah too. absolutely yeah. complicity mm-hmm. complicity well then yeah. there's but there's something similar and tangential at least i would say to white supremacy as in how people that who are not traditionally white still employ white supremacy. So maybe you can help us unpack white supremacy for a second. White supremacy is uh, simultaneously an ideology and a set of practices. And it simply, in a very simple way, is uh, the elevation, the protection of whiteness, white skin, white things that maintain whiteness, um, and protecting and maintaining the people and institutions and cultural aspects that white people deem as important. So white supremacy is simply an ideology that whiteness is better. Whiteness is good. Uh, whiteness is the p- premier thing that people want to aspire to. And for people of color, because we're people of color, we can't aspire to having white skin, although that is the case. But uh, I mean, that's a whole, that's another piece. But what we aspire to are white cultural values, right? Uh, We aspire to being white in our practices, in our value systems, and in in our performances. And Can can I just give a quick example? Did you guys hear about the lady who um, went to use her pool it was a black lady who went to use her yeah. pool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and so for the listeners, if you haven't heard about this, she went to go use her pool. She you used her pool. I mean, it was a community pool. It was a community uh-huh. pool. Sorry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was a community pool. And her neighbor, somebody who lives in mm-hmm. the community, asked for her ID <laughs> and called the police. Right. And, and what was really striking about it was that the police eventually did ask her to show her ID and, and actually asked her to, like, to show, like, that, you know, she could use the card and all of that. And it's like... Mm-hmm regardless of the fact that he was wrong, like the guy was wrong or whatever, there was still this sense of, well, we still need to make sure that you're Mm -hmm. actually okay to live here. And Mm -hmm. it's like, that Mm -hmm. is all predicated on the fact that no matter what happens, even if it's Mm -hmm. wrong for him to have called, Mm -hmm. he is his authority, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. and his value as a white person Mm -hmm. just automatically trumps hers. Even Mm -hmm. if we can all sit around and realize Mm -hmm. that this was completely wrong, like Mm -hmm. they're still going to oblige. Yes. Which is a perfect example of what you're saying. Yes. It's also critically important to understand that it's also the white, the racialized gender of the person who's calling. Right. Absolutely. It, It is. Because he was a white There's, man on um, calling on this black woman, right? Like, right. yeah, yeah. And uh, permit Patty, for instance, and uh, oh, barbecue, barbecue Becky, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they're white women who uh, exist uh, historically have existed as a way to support white supremacy, dominant male masculine white supremacy, That's right. and. Um, and they're afforded that privilege to do to do that particular role, that particular practice, right? They they get to they get to police and surveil these soft cultural spaces, and that's where that's where white women 
get a lot of their sort of white supremacist power is that they're in the schools and in the churches and in the cultural spaces where they're surveilling and policing um, uh, what it, what they deem to be appropriate um, in terms of whiteness. And that, that's, that's, that's the piece about white supremacy that I'm uh, partly focused on as well is that, you know, when we think about the classic white supremacists, we're thinking about the guy, the white guy in the hood or the white guy in, um, in the Nazi outfit. Um, but we forget that right around them or right next to them are all these white women that are also participating in the same kind of white supremacist ideology and practices as well. So I think we really have to think about this as in this way, Crenshaw's critique of intersectionality is is very appropriate because we really need to think about how whiteness functions as a part of gender for white women, which is different than for women of color and for men of color as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is a perfect segue, I think, to 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 talking about masculinity, right? The performance mm-hmm. thereof. So throughout mm-hmm. the entirety of our podcast, we've really been framing masculinity, of course, with a hard K mm-hmm. as a performance that we as a society are conditioned to learn, perform and perpetuate. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, your scholarly work goes very deep into that. And you make a really strong connection between white supremacy and what we call masculinity the performance mm. masculinity with the kid the performance of masculinity so um if you could better explain to us the connection between white supremacy and the performance of masculinity masculinity yeah um so w- it, part of uh part of the ability to do that uh would be to look at some of the historical notions of how masculinity has been constructed uh masculine ideolo- masculine ideology masculine practices and masculinity, what we in the field of psychology of men and masculinity call dominant masculinity or hegemonic masculinity, uh, is, is really white masculinity because the ideologies of masculinity that we've hidden behind these innocuous terms of hegemonic as well as dominant masculinity, what we really mean is white masculinity. And white masculinity historically has been largely undefined white masculinity has been um has been a construct that is created or has been created in opposition to deviant masculinity Mm. and deviant masculinity has always been masculinity that men men of color possess so for instance um white masculinity White masculinity, for instance, if we took a, the most stereotypical notion of it, of the pioneer masculine guy, the pioneer masculine guy who goes into, let's say, untouched land, untouched land, um, to forge a new life for uh, his family, for instance, uh, takes on a different notion or takes on a different kind of life and definition because uh, he is set in opposition to the Native man, right? The Native American masculine uh, person, that uh, they are considered the deviant, the horde of uncivilized masculinity. And the pioneer man, as part of his uh, responsibility, is to go and not only take territory, but also to civilize, civilize men of color, right? And so uh, men of color have always been defined in the sort of dichotomous, in sort of um, w- different ways of deviance. So for instance, um, I'll take Asian American men. Asian American men uh, are considered asexual or they can be considered hypersexual depending on what works in that particular stereotypic uh, context, right? Asexual model minority, the hypersexual uh, Asian American man who wants to get with white women, and that historically has been a piece of it as well. Latina Latinos, um, African American men, for instance, have also been set in that opposition as sort of this uncivilized, barbaric person, but also um, this hypersexual masculinity. Uh, and all of those things are important because white masculinity uh, 
is defined in opposition to those things. So whatever those things are is what white masculinity is not, right? So we're the civilized, we're the educated, we're the emotionally stoic, we're the composed, we're, we're the educated pious. man. Yeah. Pious man. And if you're not us, then you must be outside of that. And so that is the practice of white masculinity, dominant masculinity. And so for me as a psychologist in my research, one of the questions I've struggled with when working with men of color, not only in my clinical practice, but also in the research is what does it mean to be a man of color in the United States when and, and trying to live up to these ideals of masculinity when these ideals of masculinity inherently exclude who we are as beings, as people, as worldviews, as cultures built into it is an exclusion of who we are and what we're supposed to be. You know, yeah. what does that do for us when we're told that we have to live up to these dominant expectations of masculinity? Well, okay, let me, I'm trying to put it in my head and formulate a, or formalize a kind of a concrete thought of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And it's that it's to reduce it down. It's like white or white masculinity or traditional masculinity is normal, is good. Mm -hmm. Everything else on the contrary is bad, wrong, and because mm -hmm. of white supremacy and because of hegemony, more mm -hmm. or less, because of consent, we're trying to achieve the rightness and the goodness, and we're trying to perform the rightness and the goodness, which is traditional masculinity. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there's an inextricableness between white supremacy and whiteness and masculinity, right? Definitely. Right. Definitely. It, it's, it's, it's part and parcel of those things. You know, it's like as an Asian American man growing up, as a boy and adolescent growing up, uh, I was also learning you know, as I'm learning about what it means to be a boy, an adolescent, a man in our society, part of that learning piece is all my role models are white men. Sure. All my, all the expectations of what it means to be a man in our society are white, is white masculinity, white men sure. all around me, right? And um, all the practices that are laid out in front of me about how I'm supposed to be are about things that are congruent with white masculinity, the ways that white men practice their own masculinity. And there's not a lot out there about what it means to be an Asian American man or just generally a man of color. What is that? What does that? Well, and it's not positioned mean? as right. It's positioned as wrong or yeah. not right. You know, like right. we're, we're positioned our heroes and the culture that what is culturally observed as correct or right, right. like be correct is to be white and especially as a man or someone who's performing masculine uh, traits right you're taught one way and that is whiteness and that's an inextricableness between white supremacy and masculinity and i think right. you we we've touched upon this but can you talk about kind of the the connective tissue of consent or hegemony um i i hope i'm going to answer this question i i think we consent to it because uh there are explicit and implicit rewards mm. tied those behaviors and those practices that that for instance if you want a job if you want to succeed in that job or in that institution you have to perform masculinity in a particular way and if you're not then you're not considered a good fit in that institution or you're not considered a good team player in those institutions right so there are there are measurable meaningful economic rewards tied to masculinity it's not it's not enough to say you know i'm gonna uh, it, it, you, you can't go into an institution necessarily and say i'm gonna practice my masculinity the way that, that i want it because there are very few institutions like that there are very few social systems like that that allow it the ones that are the most powerful ones are still very white white right very they're the big uh, economic powerhouses, the big educational powerhouses are still governed by white people yeah. and whiteness and white culture and white masculinity. And if you want to be able to be successful in those spaces, you've got to learn very quickly what is being expected of you, what you can perform, what you can do in those spaces and how you can survive. Um, and I think for some men of color, uh, I'll take just use myself as an example, 
when I walk in through the doors of my college, for instance, I know that I'm expected to be a particular way and I can perform that piece. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm, ex I'm exhausted. I'm tired. It is and exhausting. It, it is exhausting, yeah. right? So when we say it's exhausting, it's exhausting, it's tiring, it's fatiguing, right? And researchers have talked about that as sort of racial battle fatigue because it's this constant like, managing 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 of your impression right and the, and uh in those white dominant cultural spaces it's it's a relief when you can find somebody that sort of you know has very similar cultural values to mm -hmm. you or a uh, sense of being that's similar to yours and you sort of close your office door and then you sort of like ah, let go and sort <laughs> right. of you know you're and you know for myself your vernacular changes you start to talk about things a little bit differently and then when you're yes. done you open the door the and you're back. switching yep it's a it's a lot of that right mm -hmm. and so it's it's exhausting to be in those spaces and so there are very few spaces where we're allowed to just be who we are um and um and even when that's the case the research shows that very quickly you become tokenized Right, you become hyper visible. You become the hyper visible, let's say, African American man in that space, and you're given a little bit of space to perform a different kind of masculinity. But with that hyper visibility and that tokenism comes also increased scrutiny about your behaviors, right? And so, there there are very few the there are very there are very few men that can do that. There are very few cultural spaces that can do that. Um, but if you're a white man you can you have a lot more range of be behaviors free. <laughs> to be yourself and to perform who you want to be as a white man yeah and most of that is either excused uh accepted and if it is excused it, it's excused via this idea that uh if they did something wrong then uh you know we'll give them the benefit of the doubt that they didn't mean it or they they didn't really intend for that to be that way and so we'll excuse it we'll give them a one-off and let them go from that and so there's a lot more um humanity flexibility humanity in its approach but for men of color that hyper visibility that scrutiny comes with the uh a much more direct consequence yeah right? there's a much more direct sort of response to it and so um and that and that's just for men of color who sort of have a good understanding of the cultural environment and then i think you know there the research the psychological research around race and racism and masculinity uh, suggests that there are also a great number of men of color who potentially don't even see themselves as men of color they just see themselves as men of color as i'm a man right and i'm just doing my thing and even in those white cultural spaces, they don't even know what it is that they're negotiating and what they're dealing with. They just, they take on the white cultural worldview mm -hmm. in themselves, right? And so you interact with them, you know, like, and you think, oh, you know, he's a man of color and I'll mention something and they sort of like look at you like, don't talk about that. Yeah. And it's not like this isn't a safe space, don't talk about it. It's like, what are you talking about? There's no racism here. <laughs> and so you're like, okay, got it. And then you sort of understand where this person is, right? And so for many men of color, people of color in these institutional spaces, we're constantly trying to figure out who people are. Navigating. And, right. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you all for listening. As mentioned, that was part one with Dr. William Liu. You'll be getting the second part soon where we take this conversation even further. Until then, we'd love for you to head to whichever platform you're listening to this podcast on, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever else, and leave us a review. Tell us and everyone what you think of our podcast. When you, when you leave that review, it helps this podcast become even more visible, and that means more people can engage in this conversation, and really that's our overall goal. You can also find us on Facebook at Masculine Podcast or on Twitter at Masculine Pod. You can also email us at masculinitypodcast at whoisthea.com. By the way, we've been getting some really incredible emails, so thank you for that. Send us any comments, emails, questions, thoughts, ideas. Uh, it's weird to be ending this by myself, but let's do it. My name is Ramoy George Philip I. Thank you for listening. Peace.